In 2824, the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces returned what few surviving jump ships they had commandeered back to civilian control. This was done so on the condition that each vessel undertake at least three mercy missions to those colonies worst affected by the drop in inter-system trade. For many, this was too little, too late. More than one Lyran traitor cited the deaths of their family to starvation as the incident that had incited them to seek vengeance. Like the other successor lords, Marcus Steiner believed that the war would soon resume. The Lyran industrial bases had been hit hard by enemy raids, hamstringing their efforts to maintain their military equipment. The Archon wanted to minimise the risk to these key assets, and so he ordered the relocation of as many factories as could be moved to safer regions away from the vulnerable borders. This process was enormously expensive, but Marcus kept quiet about where he found the funds to undertake this. Upon taking office, he had discovered some embarrassing information about his predecessors. Throughout the latter years of the Star League, Haus Steiner had been embezzling huge amounts of money and pouring it directly into the royal family's coffers. Steiner's decision to use these cash reserves now would deflect some of the public outrage should this ever come to light, but also no doubt soothed his own conscience. Not all of the successor lords were so charitable. In 2825, Captain General Charles Maddock passed an executive order which redirected all fines issued for the sale of restricted items into his own bank accounts. Jinjiro Kurita's mental state had become increasingly unsound after the end of the First Succession War, and by late 2824, he frequently lapsed into wild, violent episodes in which he would attack anyone around him. Knowledge of his condition was heavily suppressed by the internal security force. The coordinator did not feel able to step down as he believed his half-brother Zabu lacked the authority to lead the Combine in a war, especially since he did not have the backing of the district warlords. Reviewing footage of his psychotic breaks, Jinjiro observed that even when he was in a murderous rage, his strategic mind never deserted him. Kurita concluded that he could best employ what mental capacity he had left if the war resumed sooner rather than later. To that end, he began planning what would become known as the chain gang missions. Drawing from prisons and penal colonies, so-called unproductives would be used as a disposable tool against his enemies. Approximately three regiments of ad hoc forces were assembled, and equipped with battle mechs his military had deemed beyond salvageable. In exchange for their freedom, the Draconis Combine would drop them across the border, where they would then proceed to cause as much destruction as possible, and withdraw when challenged by the garrison. First targeted was the Federated Sons, in December of 2824. Their primary objective was simply to disrupt any preparation that might be underway for a resumption of Davian's counterattack. A dozen or so worlds were hit, including the former Combine planet Hudibi. Individual chain gangs were rarely larger than a company, and usually were wiped out in the first engagement. Often, they surrendered as soon as they were able, not trusting the Combine to follow through on their offer of clemency. They were right to be sceptical, as no sooner had the dropships deposited them on planet, they headed back to their jumpship and departed. The armed forces of the Federated Sons offered them little mercy, still outraged about the Kintari massacre and death of so many of their citizens. Ironically, among the chain gangs were several who had served on that cursed planet, often imprisoned for failing to execute the natives. The AWFS response came swiftly when they briefly seized control of Xi'ant, only to withdraw after another chain gang mission hit them in June. DCMS raids had never completely stopped during the interwar years, as no peace was ever agreed upon. But this was the first time the coordinator had ordered a series of attacks as part of a larger operation. To help stem the tide, Paul Davian elevated his uncle, Thomas Holder Davian, the mastermind behind the successful counteroffensive during the First Succession War, to the position of Field Marshal, 
and gave him complete control over the Kurita border. The raids would increase in frequency over the next three years, by which point the two sides were in open conflict. Some would argue that this marked the beginning of the Second Succession War, though the general consensus is that it wasn't until all fronts had become engaged that it truly commenced. The marginal success achieved against the Federated Sons convinced Jinjiro to broaden the scope of the chain gang missions to include the Lyran Commonwealth. The ISF had been busy infiltrating the nation, sabotaging several efforts to rebuild their damaged factories. A mole in the Tamar government kept them well informed on where the Lyrans were focusing their attention and where they were weakest. Lacking the numbers to undertake the desired strikes, the coordinator turned to Amphigean Agriculture Inc. Their security group had served as private defense contractors during the war, protecting the company's assets and neighboring towns from raiding. But now Kurita offered to hire them as mercenaries. Together, they formed the Amphigean Light Assault Group to bolster the chain gangs. Five experienced battalions not bound by the same code of honor that would have made using the DCMS to conduct such unsavory actions difficult. The strikes on the Commonwealth, beginning in March 2825, hit two dozen systems with varying degrees of success as before. Some were stopped with minimal effort, whereas others caused major disruption. On Tamar, three mech production lines were destroyed before the raiders were apprehended. Unbeknownst to both sides, Comstar was also complicit in the destruction. By delaying the calls for aid coming from the border worlds, they allowed the chain gangs more time to carry out their objectives, furthering their new goal of ushering in a technological decline across the inner sphere. A minor setback for the Combine occurred along the Outworlds Alliance border. The Paul Bunyan Regiment rebelled against the new company store policy, which had seen them quickly become indebted to the Draconis Combine Procurement Division. In protest, they raided the warehouses for the parts they needed, requiring two regiments of the Galadin Regulars to be dispatched in June to restore order. With the leadership removed, the unit would remain on the rolls for a few more years before being broken up and its members spread across the DCMS. This rebellion was offset by the addition of the Lone Star Regiment to their mercenary portfolio, while in other regions of space, Kunanun joined the Capellans and Boudicca's Wrath the Free Worlds, followed by the Abased the next year. Jinjiro Kurita was paying no mind to the trouble on Slatus, however because far more troubling news was coming from the opposite corner of the realm. The warlord of Razalhaeg, Taisho Munitori, was dispatching urgent messages to the capital that warned of an imminent invasion from beyond the Inner Sphere. On June 9th, an unknown force had appeared along the periphery border on the planet Svelvik. The local militia was handily dispatched by what appeared to be an elite force who seized food and supplies from the planet's stores and then promptly departed, only to reappear on December 17th at the prefecture capital Trondheim. There, the DCMS garrison was once again swept aside with ease, and this time the invaders ransacked the mayor's office complex, apparently searching for information. Learning the identity of this mystery attacker fell to the ISF, who consulted the records within Zabu Kurita's new PRE Academy. While reviewing the unit's markings, they uncovered a disturbing link. Their insignia was that of the Terran region Minnesota, and the only known unit on which said state appeared was the 331st Royal Battle Mech Division of the Star League Defense Force. The possibility that Alexander Kerensky was about to lead his exiled army back into the Inner Sphere caused mass panic within the Draconis Combine, and all military activity ceased while they prepared for a worst-case scenario. This gave the Lyran Commonwealth the chance to launch retaliatory strikes of their own. LIC agents had identified several targets of opportunity, and in May 2826, a battalion was dispatched to each. 
One of the heroes of the Light and War effort during the First Succession War was the former Rimwell's officer, General Raymond Hempstead. His efforts to retrain forces along the Draconis border in fast attack tactics proved a great success, as each raiding party returned intact. Watching with interest events unfolding along the Kiritan borders, Konrad Toyama was approached by the ambitious presenter of Barnard, Judy Cheney. She believed that Comstar could better pursue its goals if it had the ability to disseminate information among the citizens of the Inner Sphere directly. To that end, she proposed the creation of the Comstar News Bureau, a supposedly unbiased and impartial news network that could be used to stir the pot and hopefully incite further aggression between the successor states. Toyama was convinced, and with Judy Cheney at its head, the Bureau began operating just as the Lyran raids got underway. At first, the more authoritarian states of the Capellan Confederation and Draconis Combine tried to restrict syndication, but Comstar made it clear that continued use of their HPGs was dependent on them being allowed to broadcast without interference. The news that Comstar focused on was deliberately inflammatory, highlighting and exaggerating the raiding taking place along the Combine's borders, while also criticizing House Kurita for being unable to deal with the so-called Minnesota tribe. Their reports seemed timely, as the suspected SLDF unit rematerialized at Jarrett on August 19th, again striking with near impunity. On January 11th, 2827, the merchant freighter Chahar Prophet, on a mercy mission to take a grain shipment to Chandler, misjumped into the combine system Darius. They were noticed almost immediately, and the vessel was seized the next day, but not before dispatching a rare pigeon jump drone back to the Lyran Commonwealth. That a civilian vessel was in possession of such a sophisticated piece of equipment was an indication that not all was as it seemed. The jump to Darius had in fact been intentional, their mission to recover LIC agents on the planet. Rescuing the Lyran intelligence operatives was going to require a very carefully planned operation. Stepping forward to lead this expedition was Raymond Hempstead himself, once again reforming the legendary Stealths unit from the few survivors of the First War, 15 elite mech warriors with an average age of 63 were dispatched alongside an aerospace and marine support force to recover Chahar Prophet and its occupants. On February 21st, LCS Yo Mama materialized in system, with the strike team making landfall two days later. A lightning raid was able to free the captives, recover the agents, and retake control of the commandeered jump ship, returning them all safely to the Lyran Commonwealth, and bringing the people of Chandler the food supplies they had been counting on. The brilliant success of the operation prompted Hempstead to expand the stealths up to a full battalion. Just a couple of weeks after the Chahar Prophet incident, the Minnesota tribe appeared yet again on March 9th this time at Richmond. There they struck with their signature precision at the new penitentiary filled with political dissidents. The guard could not hope to stand against a unit outfitted with cutting-edge Star League equipment and were promptly disarmed. Lifting off world with thousands of liberated prisoners, they departed as swiftly as they had arrived. Comstar by this point was as concerned about reports of the Star League's return as House Kurita, and attempted to track their movement through uncolonized space. Their last contact was on the Outworld's border, in the Valentina system, after which all trace of the Minnesota tribe disappeared back into the periphery. And to this day, that is where the mystery ends. Despite the seemingly imminent return of Kerensky or his descendants, nothing ever materialized. The unanswered question is, are they still out there? In early 2827, Primus Conrad Toyama called for a meeting of the First Circuit. He was quite satisfied with the way the Draconis Combine was ramping up their aggression along their borders, but the rest of the Inner Sphere did not seem as willing to get embroiled in yet another succession war. 
To gently encourage them towards that goal, Toyama proposed Operation Divine Intervention. It was easy enough fanning the flames between Steiner and Kurita by leaking ISF activities to Loki through the Comstar News Bureau, but they also exacerbated the tension between Liao and Davian by reporting on inflammatory discussions within the Capellan House of Scions to the Ministry of Information, Intelligence and Operations. The Free Wells League remained aloof, however. Toyama bided his time, waiting for an opportunity. In January 2828, Kuritan raiders launched a retaliatory strike on Shanlar in retribution for their embarrassing defeat the previous year. This attack was doomed to fail though, as Hempstead's newly expanded stealths made short work of them. Nevertheless, as fear of the Minnesota tribe's return faded, the action along the borders increased again. Another mercenary unit, the Armored Combat Escalation Service, was taken on by Kurita to facilitate this. By the end of the year, the DCMS had begun raiding both the Federated Sons and Lyran Commonwealth in earnest. To counter this, Hempstead began rebuilding his Greyhounds from survivors of the doomed raid on Otho, the unit returning to the roles of the LCAF the next year. Relations between the Free Wells League and Lyran Commonwealth had remained civil for the most part, but a situation on Wyatt was leading to them becoming ever more strained. What should have been a run-of-the-mill prisoner exchange that December began to drag on. The lead negotiators, Kendall Marek and Rebecca Steiner Nelson, apparently shared some history, complicating matters unnecessarily. However awkward things were between the diplomats, discourse completely broke down when unknown battle mechs raided the planet. Both sides blamed the other, and a last-minute effort by the Commonwealth's second negotiator to re-establish talks was cut short by their assassination. Whoever was behind those actions, war between the two parties was now all but assured. It's all starting to kick off now then guys. House Kurita is already causing trouble with their neighbours and it's only a matter of time before the conflict spreads to consume the entire inner sphere. Toyama once again manipulating things behind the scenes. It's never explicitly stated that they were behind things on Wyatt. It's entirely possible that Kurita was the one doing it and they wanted to draw some attention away from their border to make their lives a little bit easier. But on the source books, those events are often mentioned alongside divine interventions, so uh, pretty clear which culprits the uh, authors were inferring there. But of course, there was one other major event in 2828, which I did not discuss in this video. It is going to be the focus of the next one. Because though Kurita was the first one to undertake a large-scale raiding campaign and sort of kick off the Second Succession War, large-scale conflict would return in the mid-year between Liao and Davian, involving more units than either would throw at each other during the entire First Succession War. If you thought the first one had wiped out their ability to undertake such massive operations, you were very much mistaken. I think there's a definite misconception about the scale of the First Succession War. A lot of people think it didn't match the first or even come close to it, but that's not the case. The quality of their equipment has definitely decreased, and a lot of their forces are now salvage. But their numbers are very nearly as great as they were in the early part of the First Succession War. They have been frantically rebuilding their forces for a, a major campaign, and you're definitely going to see that in the first decade of the Second Succession War. But what you're going to see is because so much of their equipment is held together with nothing more than hope and prayers, uh, once the fighting resumes, they just fall apart uh, so much quicker. They cannot sustain the, uh, the operations that they might have done in the early days of the First Succession War. Thank you once again for sticking through to the end. If you liked the video, hit the like button. You can leave me a comment. I will read it and I try to respond to as many as I can. You can subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos like this one. There's another 11 chapters coming in this series. And if you want to go further with your support, you can also find a Patreon link in the description below. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Next time, the Second Succession War is going to begin in earnest with two enormous campaigns 
along the Liao-Davian border, and I hope you'll join me again for that.